Thank you, Ines. You have been very kind in introducing. It's always weird. I mean, there's certainly so much more that we can say about each other. Only uh, professors and associate professors and people in academia can up, come up with these long titles for something, because every word means something. Um, uh, so, um, uh, but it's actually a, a different story behind it. The title may be a bit, you know, confusing. Or I mean, I, how many of you have thought about reverse discrimination in the last 10 years? at least as a concept. Do you recognize the words? Do you? I mean, basically, I mean, what we're talking about is that the member state can be more evil towards its own citizens than towards EU citizens visiting or, you know, having a privileged status. So, uh, uh, where I get this curiosity is that when I started teaching about uh, EU law and then the looking into the practice of the Court of Justice, when the Court of Justice is talking about the spillover effect or the potential that EU law may you know, grow into constitutional, basically have a spillover to constitutional uh, equal treatment principles. And uh, then I came across a case, it's a famous case, you will certainly know it. It's related to Lettre d'Argy, Agri, sorry, yes. It's a plant in France. It's actually a real photo from the production facility you can find it on YouTube. It's, uh, they were producing milk products, cheese. Uh, now they are having paintball battles because the building is you know, no longer in use. It's really, I mean, the videos are great fun. So if you have some time during this lecture, you can just play them on YouTube without sound, please, yes, if you can. Uh, and uh, Jean-Pierre Guimont, who is uh, a famous person, everyone in EU law, basically he was being uh, subject to a raid there was an investigation, and, uh, and he was accused of frauds and falsification relating to products or services. So it may be very strange for people from this region, but they were actually having a criminal prosecution against him uh, for producing the wrong kind of cheese. And that sounds really weird. I mean, maybe it's okay for someone from France. I don't know if there's anyone representing. Is it normal for, you know, having a criminal proceeding against someone who produces the wrong kind of cheese? <laughs> well, the, Dutch the, the Dutch take their cheese very serious. I was just going to address you separately about that. But anyway, uh, so, so the case is famous and known to you. It's about um, Emmental. And what happened was that they were producing, a, according to the law, Emmental is a cheese with a firm, it's a firm cheese uh, with a rind of a color between ivory and pale yellow with holes of a size between a cherry and a very specific, isn't it? Hard, dry rind of a color between golden yellow and light brown. So if your cheese doesn't look exactly like that, you might be a criminal. If we call it Emmental, yes. Well, anyway, it's, uh, we, 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 we <laughs> it's obvious for the Dutch. Yes. <laughs> uh, if you look at the history, I mean, all this uh, Reinheitsgebot and uh, these cases that we all teach our students about, well, it's quite clear that, you know, under EU law, you cannot determine what beer is for everyone else in Europe. Uh, you know, just can't say it. Well, uh, apparently, the French tried to do it with cheese. Uh, and uh, according to the law, then, if you look at this, then you know which, which cheese is legal and which is not um, uh, so, so, so uh, uh, in lectures, I mean, we try to tell to the students that there is supposed to be a European element, you know, to the relationship for the internal market law to be applicable, this relationship has to be cross-border, at least free movement of goods and so on. So the court, I mean, in my mind, at least in the beginning of my studies, I thought a natural response from the court would be, sorry, internal market law is not applicable. Uh, there's no cross-border element, hence it's, uh, the question is moot. You know, it's a theoretical question, we don't have to answer it. We know that that wasn't the answer. So what was the answer? The answer was, well, should you, I mean, you're the better judge, the National Court, you're a better judge to decide if you need our in interpretation, but should you have a provision that talks about equal treatment? You know, then our answer might be useful for you. Therefore, we say that, uh, yes, that doesn't fly, you cannot dictate for the rest of Europe what kind of rind yes, uh, cheese should have. Therefore, we respond that this uh, limitation is uh, contrary to EU law. Should the relationship have a cross-border dimension? So it's a lot of shoulds, woulds, coulds, things. But I was 
puzzled by this because I was thinking, imagine a national judge. Let's say it's an evil Estonian judge you know, in a situation in southern Estonia, you know, cross-border thing, something is being transported across the border, perhaps alcohol. Uh, and then there is two people involved. There is one Latvian, one Estonian, and the question is somehow you know, protected by the internal market law. So can you imagine the judge sentencing, saying, listen, you Latvian guy, sorry, you know, internal market, you're protected, you can go, but you evil Estonian guy, I will prosecute you and you will go to jail because you're, you know, you breach something and you're not a protected citizen. You, we, I can exercise my right of reverse discrimination on you. Can you imagine the dilemma in the head of the judge? Just this formalistic, you know, cross-border element being missing. So it's very tempting to go for this equal treatment, if you think about it. It's extremely tempting, especially in, you know, these cases where you have criminal proceeding for every roll of cheese uh, that you're producing. So my natural instinct was to say, well, actually, there's no point in treating these situations differently. I'm thinking, so what's the point? I mean, if one guy gets away with it, why not let the other guy go? And it seemed very simple and very logical. And, um, and you know, if you look at this, I mean, with the Emmental example, it's perfectly fine. You know, anyone can do it. You know, it's legal. If you sold Estonian cheese to France or the French cheese to Estonia, it will be legal at the same time. But if you are selling it, you know, inside your country, then it's, you know, liability. It doesn't make any sense. Why would it be a liability? Why would you have the right to prosecute your own people? And uh, sure enough, just recently, I mean, in, in our academia, everything is recent, you know. The decision from 78 is just, you know, it was one of the founding ones, but, you know, 2008 is just recent. Estonia joined only recently 2004. Have you noticed? We're getting older. Uh, so the French uh, Conseil Constitutionnel actually um, uh, agreed with the Court of Justice in that sense that they said that it's, there, there is a spillover and it wouldn't make any sense to treat the French companies in internal situations um, very much differently from cross-border situations. It's a parent-daughter directive. I don't know if you have had any dealings with it, uh, but in principle, there was a withholding tax on dividends and uh, a decision by the Court of Justice was that you cannot apply it in cross-border situations, which is perfectly obvious. It's just, you know, A and B. But what the court constitutionnel, sorry, Conseil Constitutionnel said is that, well, actually, because of this decision, we have to treat also wholly internal situations similarly. So we are not going to apply this tax also in wholly internal situations. And that seems also quite reasonable, wouldn't you say? I mean, from, a per, from the point of view of competition, but is it actually so obvious from the point of view of, of law? Does the principle of equal treatment in our constitution, I'm sure everyone has one, you know, does it actually mean that you have to treat your own citizens equally to those protected by the internal market rules? I mean, I'm not sure. It seemed to me, at least you know, following this, I, I was very enthusiastic. I said, well, finally my point has been made. Equal treatment for everyone, spillover, you know, there's no point. Let's, not, let's also let the Estonian go you know, next to the Latvian. They will both be happy. Um, well, you know, because in this example, you can, you know, tax dividends, you cannot tax dividends to Latvia from the French mother company, uh, daughter company, or Greece, or, but then, you know, you're treating the French equally to the people from Brazil or China, if you would not provide them equal treatment. And that sounds counterintuitive. I mean, why would you treat your own citizens worse? I mean, equally to the, I mean, nothing wrong with the Chinese, but in principle, just they're not in the EU. So we are EU citizens, why would you treat them worse? And you have the equal treatment on the basis of citizenship and you have all these um, thoughts, ideas, concepts and so on. Are you with me? Do you agree that we should guarantee equal treatment to everyone? Yeah. Well, um, I thought so. So uh, we had a very um, uh, populist government, local municipal government in Tallinn. So the central government and the city government were always different coalitions somehow a balance of power, so the central government was different, liberal, you know, and so on, and, and uh, uh, city government was more social, and, uh, you know, there was a difference in point of view. Currently, they are being prosecuted, many of the former members of the city government, not because of political things, but because of bribery and stuff. Uh, but they came up with a brilliant idea. 
long, many, many years ago to have a discounted ticket price for public transport, which is, again, something that is sort of like, why would, you, why would it be wrong to have your own citizens with a little bit discounted ticket on a bus? Residents. Doesn't sound completely illegal. Yeah? Well, anyway, they, they, they took it further and they decided to have uh, free public transport for all the residents of Tallinn. So you have registered residents, you're saying, I'm living here, and you, know, you just validate, I, my card is on the table there, I will show you later, you just validate in the bus and you drive for free. You have ID card and the, you know, the thingy and you're free to go. But if you look at it in more detail, I mean, residents of Tallinn, students of the age, blah, 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 we get all the free, free ride, but you know, if you think about what is the situation with uh, European law, can we say that the Finnish or the Latvians who are going to work in Tallinn or visiting museums, can we say that they have to pay, that they should not have the equal treatment with the residents of Tallinn? Do you remember some cases? I mean, there's, there's something in the internal market that we have seen some years ago. Well, under EU law, there have been cases, many cases, but at least uh, Italy had one of the famous ones, and the Spain, Spaniards had the other one. You know what I'm talking about. Um, free admission for Italian citizens uh, to museums, monuments, galleries, uh, archaeological digs, parks, and gardens. Do you know the case? Yes. So what was the decision of the court? I mean, what the authorities tried to argue? The authorities argued, well, residents pay tax revenue. We are supporting the museums from this revenue. Therefore, you know, it's okay to give them preference they should have free of charge access and everybody else who doesn't contribute to tax revenue uh, should pay for the ticket. Do you remember the logic? Well, uh, the court says that this is discrimination on the basis of nationality. It doesn't fly. And most interestingly, they said economic aims cannot constitute overriding reasons in the general interest. There is a nuance in, um, uh, in internal market case law which says that you can I mean, I'm paraphrasing it, but in principle, you can only rely on your own contribution if it's really directly linked. You, you can economically, you can count, you know, I paid 10 euros more and I have dri driven the bus for 10 euros. And in all ca other cases, it doesn't fly. And in general, the court excludes completely economic games as such. So, um, uh, and the same thing in Spain, when... Um, once again, there was a free admission to museums. In this case, it was even, I, I believe, if I remember it correctly, it was even you know, said on the basis of citizenship and residence. You have both the direct discrimination and the indirect discrimination because residence requirement is counted as an indirect discrimination on the basis of nationality because Estonians are more li likely to be resident in Tallinn. That's you know, a line of case law that we have. So the court says that this discrimination is prohibited. Because people, and the arguments were both cases, it was like people you know, travel to go to museums, so therefore they should have equal treatment. I don't know if you think about now about the example of Tallinn. So should we have free tickets for people from Riga on the basis of these two examples? It, it seems to me quite logical. I mean, because uh, you are EU citizens, you're traveling there for receiving services, going to museums. In principle, we should guarantee you a, a free transport in Tallinn. It seems to me in this case. And, and any argument to the contrary, I mean, you can take it on the freedom of, I mean, uh, free movement of workers. You have cases, you know, I, many cases about how you can register your vehicle in a registry or something like that. Very minor infringements have been counted contrary to EU law. So the funny thing is that if you go to Tallinn and you want to now take this uh, advice that I have given to you and you want to go to the bus, you actually cannot buy a ticket. There is no free ticket that you can buy because you have to you know, have the ID card and the, and the plastic thingy. And so basically you will have to get fined. Traditionally you'll away, you get fined, uh, then you challenge the penalty and then you find out if you were right or wrong. Yeah. Well, this is... Uh, a conclusion that I'm relatively okay with. I think that it's fine. I think that Latvians can win this case, and the Finns probably, and the Polish, and the Czech, and so on. But the question, next question is, can the people from Tartu, or Pärnu, or Valga, 
the other cities of Estonia, can they also come and say, well, because of this privilege that we're giving to the Latvians, we are protected under Article possibly 12 of the Constitution saying equal treatment. And of course, as a EU lawyer, I thought, yes, of course, and I went off to you know, research it. And then I spoke to some legal scholars in Estonia and uh, read some of the pieces, and I found out that it's not so easy. Uh, so, and the reason why it's not so easy is that in that case, when we're applying constitutional law, the list of justifications seems to be a bit different. Um, and this brings in, especially with the public transport, it brings in a document that is not so often quoted or referred, but it's, uh, it's the European Charter of Local Self-Government, which in very many words talks about basically local democracy, competition between municipalities, and it also talks about right of self-financing. And it, it, it's not really clear what they mean in detail. I mean, it, it can be subject to very many different interpretations, but in principle, they are entitled to the resources required for the fulfillment of their tasks. And if you think about it, it's, a, it's like almost a treaty. Yes. So it's called the Charter. So people have signed, member states have agreed that this is important. It seems to be something that we consider central to the functioning of what? The functioning of democracy. So it's not even, you know, just, you know, it's nice that you have your local uh, music gatherings or uh, folk dance group, but actually what we're talking about is that it's uh, very important to have these rights granted on the local, stand, local level to protect democracy and decentralization of power. If you think about overriding matters of public interests, would you think democracy is one of them? I mean, would it be something relatively high up, high up on, the, on the scale. So um, what happened in Estonia uh, is that, again, the same city government of Tallinn introduced uh, a childbirth allowance. It's, it's happened before. Luxembourg had it. I'm sure member states had it. So, so people, are, they, they said that, well, both parents of, uh, if both parents of a child are registered, in uh, the population registry as residents of Tallinn, then they get a certain amount of money from the city government in case of childbirth. And the case is interesting, uh, I mean, for, for, for me it's interesting because of this re reverse discrimination thing, but for normal people it's interesting and the case w was actually based on the question, what, if ha what happens if one of your parents has disappeared into the depths of Russia or actually it has deceased? So then it's impossible for you to meet the criteria of having both parents registered in Tallinn. Just physically impossible. And the Chancellor of Justice, which is like an ombudsman position, challenged this and said it's unclear. It wasn't a reverse discrimination issue. And, and the Supreme Court uh, decided that actually it's fine because you can interpret it with a brain. So basically if your dad is gone, you, know, you don't have to meet that criteria. Which is debatable in terms of if, if the norm actually meets the standards of legal clarity and precision, but basically, I mean, fine. You know, if you're a single parent uh, living in a slum somewhere, you should know the theory of constitutional interpretation and you know, find that particular provision, uh, decision of the uh, Supreme Court instead of just reading the law. But anyway, it works. Um, but the list of justifications uh, for this criteria was, uh, it's listed here on the slide, that we are trying to support the families, fine, yeah, anywhere, flies anywhere. Uh, uh, we're trying to have a strong family, which is a bit weird. I mean, if you're registered as residents in the same town, does it mean that you are you know, very close? Would be debatable. Uh, but importantly, they also said the need to ensure receipt of the income tax uh, to the city budget. And that is what? A purely financial goal. And in fact, it's, uh, it's, it's something that is proven in terms of uh, uh, finance. 
every additional resident in Tallinn somehow statistically increases the revenues of the city budget, allowing them to provide better services, allowing them to have this free transport, allowing them to open gyms and pools and stuff like that, just statistically. But we learn from the practice of the Court of Justice that it doesn't fly in EU law. So there is a contradiction because we have on the, uh, uh, in the charter that we just looked at, we have this discussion about local finances, competition. At the same time, we have ECJ saying financial means or goals are not a justification. So, so there's, a, there's a discussion. And, and this argument can be criticized on so many levels. I mean, just a funny uh, fact is that when they first introduced this free transport, one of the things that they said was that, well, it's really bad because bums will be using it to keep warm in the winter. You have heard of the word bum, yes? I know it's not probably the right place to talk about uh, citizens or, or people with less privilege, but they are not paying taxes. I mean, alcoholics, not, I mean, maybe some are, yeah. But uh, kids under 18 year old, students, there's no, direct connection between being a resident and actually paying taxes. But statistically there is. So physically, the fact that I'm driving the bus doesn't mean that I've contributed anything. But statistically it does. And, um, and if you think about it, there is no mathematical link. And funny enough, you can register yourself to be a resident in Tallinn without actually living there. You just have to need, somebody actually has to just, you know, say he's living here. But there are no penalties, there is no police coming to your door checking that if you actually live there. It's just sort of a letter that you send to the government, municipality. So, so the link between the contribution is just statistical. But the Supreme Court decided that. First of all, finding budget income sources is a part of the right of self-management. And notice that it expressly points out that there it recognizes that there is no direct link. It says, although the services are not provided directly as compensation for the person's contribution, so on and so forth, still it's justified. So the local government is competent to find uh, budget sources. It is competent to compete on these levels. And therefore, constitutionally, it's fine. And there is no cross-border element, so we're not talking about the internal market case law. Has the court be breached EU law in this matter? Somehow. Probably not. Whole internal situation, its own residence, you know, local money that is being distributed. If a Finnish person wants to have this uh, support, they can register themselves as a resident in Tallinn. So there's no prohibition on the basis of nationality. So it's really a question about a different structure for measuring the uh, uh, justification of a limitation of a fundamental right. On a EU level, the court says municipal self-governance is really not that important. On national level, it seems to be more or less fine. So what we found is that uh, on the EU level, I think that it wouldn't fly. I think I'm, I'm quite positive that Inessa can come to Tallinn and you know, we will take this battle with some law students and at least 50% likelihood of success. Um, uh, then, uh, but on the national level, I, I really don't see a good reason to say that the Supreme Court was wrong. Because it is completely competent to come up with its own list of overriding matters of national interest to justify limitations of discrimination. You may you know, argue with uh, one or the other position adopted, but in principle, they have this competence. So, uh, as a result, when I went out on a journey to actually prove uh, that this is all wrong and people from Tartu should get the free public transport, I ended up being proven wrong. And uh, I'm more than convinced, more convinced than ever now, that actually the spillover effect against reverse discrimination has its own limitations. It's not possible to take it just so, no, boom, now, you know, mother-daughter directive, it's gone, can't have it internally, because these examples show that actually you can have wholly internally situations where discrimination may be justified. And this is now 
uh, uh, manifested in a publication. Like we, no, it's, if, it, if you don't publish, it doesn't exist. I have a few copies. If you want them, I, I, can, I can distribute. Uh, and uh, uh, if you're not the resident of Tallinn, you can still enjoy free transportation um, as long as the police don't find out. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for very interesting also insight in development in Estonia. I would say we had many similar issues also in Latvia. I'm actually Artur Skuc from Constitutional Court of Latvia. I wanted to ask you about reverse discrimination, which you said, because in the court we recently had a case about basically also about Riga municipality. And it has provisions that basically, I think in five years, uh, all casinos, not casinos, but games, um, uh, they will be banned in Old Town and basically in the center of Riga. In that case, that was a Latvian registered company, so the court didn't go into EU law. But uh, I would wonder, it, could this Latvian company, and this has been debated in academic debate, could they invoke EU law uh, despite the fact that when you talk about reverse discrimination, uh, because provision of services, if that would be, for example, Estonian company registered, that would be a, an issue. Could this Latvian company basically also invoke EU law, despite the fact that it's registered in Latvia and it's operating in Latvia, to, to challenge, this, for example, a restriction on their business? So, mm -hmm. Thanks. And uh, I assume that the shareholders are also Latvian, yes? Yes. Okay. Um, my immediate reaction after having proven this wonderful thing uh, uh, is that no, that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that that would be a national constitutional issue. Uh, but we have a long list of case law uh, saying that you can set up these structures to protect your investment. Because that would be also a freedom of establishment issue. Um, and it is a freedom of establishment issue if somebody has made substantial investment into Latvia, set up casinos all over the, you know, the city, and then suddenly say, well, time to move out. Uh, I understand there is a transition period and so on. But uh, looking at the history of cases, I, would, I cannot advise these people, but I would say that why not merge with someone with foreign investors? You, know, you just need a small you know, company to merge with, and then it would be a part of this protective regime. That, that would be something that could be at least considered. Does that sound like reasonable advice to you? <laughs> Not for me. <laughs> <laughs> Just maybe to pick up there, uh, there may even be easier solutions to the extent that I think, um, I think that the, the conceptual underlying fundamental problem will remain there as long as we have reverse discrimination and the court simply says, that's part of the scope of EU law, right? It's a scope issue. It's not an issue of equal treatment or fairness or democracy. It's a scope issue. Um, but I think the court has gone quite far in simply eliminating the issues where the scope doesn't apply. For example, in this case, if you look at the Treiber and Harmse case, if there's any chance that a foreigner will enter one of those casinos, you could already claim that you're under the scope of EU law. Now, try proving that there is not a single foreigner in a casino in in Tallinn. So um, on that level, I think the court has already given enough munition for anyone to draw something into EU law if you really want to. I think it's, it's very challenging. Now the court, the commission has been a bit more restrictive in terms of state aid lately, but in terms of free movement, it's very hard. And then as to the justification, I was just wondering if member states don't have more space, if they're more creative as well. You cannot be too open. I mean, I, was, uh, I did quite some work on games of chance now, national governments cannot say we want to do this because it, we make more money, which is mostly what they're doing. <laughs> this is their key objective, but they can't say it. And the court is extremely flexible if you rephrase it. Um, the Swedes said we want, to we want to prevent the evil of private money being derived from a moral evil. And apparently it's not bad if you derive money publicly from a moral evil. <laughs> right? So that's fine. Okay, court, that's fine because then it's not about money. 
Um, with taxation, you cannot say I want to increase taxation, but you can say I want to protect the integrity and coherence of my tax system. And then suddenly it's fine. So to what extent is the court solving this problem also by simply asking member states to be more creative or, if you be, want to be frank, to lie about their true objectives? <laughs> Uh, it's uh, for the first part uh, about uh, having tourists entering casinos and whether it can, yes, it can bring you to the sphere of EU law uh, if you take it from the perspective of the tourist and you will always find one, yes. Uh, the question is that for my point of view, this is more like a freedom of establishment issue uh, because of this, um, like Kaixa Brunk France, uh, cases like that where, where you have these overnight changes in law or restrictions. Of, so so, so on, on the freedom of establishment, I think, uh, on the free movement of persons, I think your chances will be lower because the, there are always changes in law. So, I mean, you cannot expect that you will be able to go to casinos forever in a certain country. Whereas if you've made an investment um, of hundreds of millions, then, then you have a little bit higher level of expectations towards the country. Uh, regarding this uh, court inviting people to be more creative, yes, uh, th th there is an issue that, uh, that sometimes uh, creative writing exercises the work that lawyers have to do. Uh, but with the limitations that the court has put on us with this mathematical connection and even in this coherence of the tax system, they have been quite restrictive. So it's very difficult to come up with something that is watertight. The, the, the problem that I have is more related to the fact that, that when does the issue become theoretical enough for the court to refuse answering? And that's, that's a little bit of a... I, I, I don't see that, you know... The justification that, yes, we trust the national judge, it sort of it goes to a certain way, but at the one point it's like, how, how much do you trust them? I mean, at some point you did say that if the question is theoretical, if you don't understand how it relates to the facts, then I don't answer. And that's, that's what, but yes, creative writing can be certainly something that, uh, that lawyers do. Okay, thank you. Mm. Are there any questions? Maybe I can ask uh, one, uh, this, uh, the same uh, article uh, for part two of uh, Treaty of European Union. It refers to respect to national identities and also says inclusive of regional and local self-government. Maybe it's uh, time to also uh, invoke this article also for those uh, local self-government issues and say what the, see what co the court says. It is a valid point, uh, and uh, interest, uh, just, you know, it's a word of academics, so, so I will tell you this. The original line of thought with our research group ended up with a conclusion that actually you should have the possibility to have local municipal government as one of the justifications, at least to be considered, I mean, uh, against proportionality. So if you can prove that without this restriction, uh, the free tra public transport has to disappear. I mean, just too extreme. I can't afford it without this solution. Then at least the court could have a proportionality approach. We submitted this um, to one of the top journals of EU law, and the reviewer said, well, that doesn't really fly. You should change that. Otherwise, the article is fine. Uh, and then the, uh, the review panel said, well, although the reviewer said it's fine, uh, actually, we're not publishing it anyway. So we changed it a little bit to a softer solution, saying that it doesn't fly as the practice of the court is today. And we should consider it, but it doesn't fly. Then we sent it to another, the one that published it, yes? And the reviewer says, why are you being so conservative? You should say that the municipal autonomy is actually a very good justification. So we went through that experience and both, which it just comes down to the independent anonymous reviewer. And uh, I agree that uh, the treaty has it, and the Charter has it, and I don't see that in 2019 it's so preposterous to say that at least we could consider if this, I mean, the free public transport is for public good, it's fighting pollution, it's fighting, you know, all kinds of problems in the city, it's saving money from road construction. So if the municipality can prove that it's absolutely necessary to have this discrimination, then it could be okay. Because we have examples from the internal market case law when you can prove that without discrimination you cannot achieve the goal and it's okay so why not accept municipal autonomy as one of these things I agree with you and I think there is certainly an argument to, made, to be made in that direction yes and thanks to the reviewers now we have both uh, lines of thought covered okay.